everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mandeep, and my colleague Catherine and I work at Microsoft. And today we are going to discuss what is Check C and how we've added memory safety support to LLVM using Check C. This is a brief outline of our talk today. We are going to start off with discussing what is Check C. Then we are going to talk about the implementation of Check C in Clank. We are then going to describe two novel algorithms. The first one to automatically widen bounds for null terminated pointers, and the second one for comparison of expressions. Then we are going to discuss how to convert legacy C code to check C. We are also going to talk about some experimental evaluation of check C. And finally, we are going to share resources for further reading. So the C language is not a memory safe language meaning that C allows for unrestricted access to memory. This can have unintended consequences. Uh, C suffers from several memory safety hazards, and two of the well-known ones are buffer overflows, wherein you can write past the end of an array, and null pointer dereference, wherein you have an uninitialized pointer and you try to dereference that pointer. So the intended behavior in this case is not defined by the C language. And check C tries to remedy both of these. So what exactly is check C? Check C is an extension to C designed to support spatial safety. Most importantly, check C adds three new types of checked pointers that are bounds checked. Every C program is also a check C program. So check C allows for incremental porting, meaning that you can convert as much or as little of your legacy C code to check C as you want. The syntax of check C has been borrowed from C++ templates for convenience. And we have implemented check C in our fork of Clank. Now let's look at the three types of check pointers that check C adds. The first type is underscore PTR of type T. Now this is a pointer to a singleton object and it points to an object of type T. Most important, importantly, no pointer arithmetic is allowed for these types of pointers and they are used only for dereference. And the compiler will automatically add runtime checks for non-nullness if necessary. Let's look at the syntax for underscore PTR. So on the left hand side, we have C code. And on the right hand side, we have the corresponding check C syntax. As you can see, every instance of T star in legacy C can be replaced with underscore PTR of type T in check C. And you can also have modifiers like const and volatile. So the second type of pointer that check C adds is underscore array PTR. Uh, now this is a pointer to an element of an array of type T. And pointer arithmetic is allowed on these types of pointers. And the compiler will automatically insert runtime checks for non-nullness and bounds checks if necessary. Let's look at the syntax. So in C, we can either declare a pointer to an element of an array or we can declare an array. Uh, similarly, we have uh, two separate syntaxes in check C. Uh, the first one will declare a, a pointer to an element of an array of type T. And the second one, using the underscore checked keyword, uh, we can declare a checked array. And all three types of pointers uh, can be passed to functions as parameters and can also be returned from functions. And the third type of pointer that check C adds is an underscore anti array PTR. Now, these are very similar to the array PTR. The only difference is that uh, these point to a sequence of elements that ends with a null terminator. And by definition, an element of the sequence can be read, provided the preceding elements are not the null terminator. Now, this gives rise to the observation that the bounds of an anti-array pointer can be widened based on the number of elements read. And later on in the talk, we'll look at an algorithm to automatically widen bounds for these pointers. So the syntax for an anti-array pointer is exactly similar to the syntax for an array PTR. The only difference is that we will use the underscore anti array PTR and the underscore anti checked uh, keywords. To help ensure spatial memory safety, array pointers, including null terminated array pointers, have bounds expressions that describe the range of memory that they can be used to access. To maintain low-level control, programmers can declare bounds for pointer-typed variables and struct members. These bounds act as invariants that must be maintained throughout the program. The compiler uses the bounds to insert runtime checks for memory accesses and statically checks that the program does not violate bounds invariants. 
Programmers can use four different kinds of bounds expressions to declare bounds for an array pointer P. Count or byte count bounds specify the number of array elements or bytes that P can access. Range bounds use two expressions to specify the lower and upper bound of memory that P can access. And unknown bounds mean that P cannot be used to access memory. Let's look at an example of a dynamic check that uses bounds to check a pointer access. While traversing the Clang AST, the compiler can visit an expression that uses a pointer to access memory, such as P sub I. The pointer typed expression that is used to read memory here is P plus I, which uses the pointer P to access memory. Next, the compiler infers the bounds for the pointer P. In this case, these are the bounds of count of len that the programmer has declared. These bounds expand to the bounds of P comma P plus len. These expanded bounds are used to insert a dynamic check at the expression P sub I that reads memory. Runtime, the dynamic check verifies that the pointer expression is within the bounds. In this case, it checks that P plus I is between P and P plus len. When I is equal to len in the last iteration of this loop, the dynamic check will fail and the program will exit. The compiler statically checks that the bounds declared by the programmer are maintained throughout the program. At each statement in a control flow graph, the compiler infers bounds for each pointer. It then converts the inferred and declared pointer bounds to ranges and finally checks that the declared range is within the inferred range. At assignments, the right-hand side bounds must contain the left-hand side bounds. At function calls, the argument bounds must contain the declared parameter bounds. Bounds for each pointer are inferred based on the kind of statement that is currently being analyzed. For example, in an assignment, the inferred bounds for P are the bounds of the right-hand expression. If variables used in the declared bounds of P are modified, the inferred bounds of P are updated. If the compiler can determine an original value for the variable before the modification, the original value is used in the inferred bounds. Otherwise, if the value of the variable is lost, the inferred bounds for P are unknown. Once the compiler has inferred bounds for a pointer P, the declared and inferred bounds of P are both converted to ranges. A range consists of a base expression, a lower offset, and an upper offset. For the inferred bounds of a pointer to be valid, the bases of the inferred and declared ranges must be equal, and the inferred range must contain the declared range. If the inferred upper offset is below the declared upper offset, or the inferred lower offset is above the declared lower offset, the inferred bounds violate the declared bounds. If the compiler can prove that the inferred bounds are invalid, this is a compile time error. For example, the inferred bounds here are too narrow to contain the declared bounds. If the compiler can neither prove nor disprove that the inferred bounds are valid, this is a compile time warning. For example, it is unknown here whether the expression E is greater or less than two, so the compiler cannot determine whether the declared range is within the inferred range. So recall that we had said that we can widen the bounds of a null terminated pointer based on the number of elements read. Let's look at an example for that. So let's assume we have an anti array pointer P with declared bounds P comma P, wherein uh, P is the lower bound and P is also the upper bound. So let's say we see a dereference if star P. Now this dereference is at the current upper bound, which is P. So we can widen the bounds here by one. Why we can do so is because if the element at the upper bound is non-null, then it means that there is at least one more element after this, which is a null terminator. So we can widen the bounds by one. So after widening, the new bounds for P are P comma P plus one, where P plus one is now the new upper bound. So after this, if we see a dereference, star p plus one, then this dereference is also at the current upper bound, which is p plus one. So we can further widen the bounds by one. So the new bounds are p comma p plus two, where p plus two is the new upper bound. And then when we see a dereference at p plus three, we notice that this dereference is not at the current upper bound, which is p plus two. So we can no longer widen the bounds. In fact, this is an out of bounds memory access and we should flag an error. And that's exactly what the compiler does. So let's look at how we've implemented uh, the bounds widening for null terminated pointers. 
So this has been implemented as a data flow analysis, and these are the properties of the data flow uh, analysis. It's a forward analysis, uh, meaning a basic block is visited before its successors. It's path sensitive, meaning the data flow analysis generates different facts on the then and the else branches. It's flow sensitive, meaning the analysis depends on the order of statements in a basic block. And it's intra-procedural, meaning uh, it's done at one function at a time. So we compute various data flow sets for uh, the analysis, namely gen, kill, in, and out sets. And two of these sets, the gen and the out sets, are computed on edges, whereas the kill and the in sets are computed on blocks. So the gen set on an edge PIBJ and on the edge condition of the form if uh, star P plus one uh, signifies that on that edge, the anti-area pointer P can potentially be widened by one. So we will add the mapping P comma one to the gen set on that edge. The kill set of a block signifies uh, all the anti-array pointers whose bounds are killed inside the block. So if I is a variable which is used in the declared bounds uh, of an anti-array pointer P, and if I is assigned to inside block B, then it means we kill the uh, widened bounds of P inside that block. So we can add P to that block. The inset of a block uh, is computed as an intersection of the outsets of all the incoming uh, edges to that block. And the outset on a block is computed uh, as the difference of the in and the kill sets of that block, uh, union with the gen on all the outgoing edges from that block. So we worked out an example of the data flow analysis for you. And we will leave most of this as an exercise to, to the reader, uh, but we would like to draw your attention to a couple of points here. Uh, so if you look at the code on line number two, we have declared an anti area pointer P with uh, upper bound P plus K. And on lines three and four, uh, we basically dereference the uh, anti area pointer at the upper bounds, so we can widen the bounds at, at blocks three and four. And on line number five, we assign to K, meaning we are killing the bounds of P. So how do we decide if the dereference is at the current upper bounds or not? Let's assume we have an anti-area pointer P with declared upper bounds P plus I plus J plus four. Then on the left-hand side of this table, we have various cases where we can widen the bounds. And on the right-hand side, we have various cases where we cannot widen the bounds. Let's take a look at each one of these. So on the left-hand side, the first expression is P plus I plus J plus one plus three. Uh, so we can uh, see here that we can do a constant folding of one plus three, and that would result in four. So after constant folding, this expression would be equivalent to the declared upper bound. So we can widen there. And similarly for expressions two, three, and four, we can do some constant folding and then make this expression equivalent to the declared upper bounds. Whereas, whereas on the right-hand side, if you see the first expression is P plus I plus J plus three, uh, we cannot make this expression equal to the uh, upper bound. Uh, and similarly for expressions two, three, and four. So basically we need a mechanism to determine if two expressions are equivalent or not. We use a data structure called the pre-order AST for semantic comparison of expressions. Now this is very similar to the Clang's AST, but it has some peculiarities. The first is it's an n array tree, meaning one node can have more than one children. It's a pre-order tree, as the name suggests, uh, meaning it represents an expression in the pre-order form. It's a flattened tree, meaning at each level, we coalesce the nodes with their parents. And the underlying expression represented by the tree is normalized by constant folding and sorting the nodes of the tree. So let's take a look at how this tree is constructed. So let's assume we have two expressions, E1 and E2, and we need to decide whether E1 and E2 are equal or not. So the first step is to create the pre-order ASTs for E1 and E2. On the left, left and the right-hand side, you can see two trees. Uh, these represent the ASTs for E1 and E2, respectively. The second step is to coalesce the leaf nodes having a commutative and associative operator. These are the trees after the first round of coalescing. After the second round, we have these two trees. And on the right hand side, there's one more opportunity to call these. So we do that. Step is to lexicographically sort the leaf nodes having a commutative and associative operator. So this is the result after sorting. The fourth step is to constant fold the integer nodes having a commutative and associative operator. So this is the result after the first step of constant folding. 
The fifth step is to sort the subtrees having a commutative and associative operator. So we can sort the children nodes of the multiplication node. So after sorting, these are the two trees, and these trees have now been normalized. So the final step is to compare the two ASTs node by node to determine if the underlying expressions are The expression may overflow, may not overflow, but may not overflow, but the expression may overflow after we reassociate the expression in the in the pre-order AST. One possible solution for this is to treat signed integer overflow as two's complement, which is what uh, we are pursuing currently. So we enable the flag f wrap v in Clang. But the next question is: what about pointer arithmetic overflow? And GCC has a flag f wrap v dash pointer, which also which treats pointer arithmetic also as two's complement. But we couldn't find a corresponding flag in Clang. So this is still a problem for us. One of the design goals of Check C is backwards compatibility. Programmers can incrementally opt in to bounds checking, gradually making code more memory safe. To add bounds checking to a function while maintaining compatibility with unchecked code, Check C introduces the notion of a bound safe interface. Bound safe interfaces support incremental conversion by allowing the programmer to specify alternate checked types for unchecked functions. The programmer can also add bounds for parameters and return types. These functions still accept unchecked pointer arguments and perform bounds checking when called with checked pointer arguments. To convert a function using a bound safe interface, we first determine the alternate checked types for the function parameters and return value. Next, we add any applicable bounds to the function. And finally, we update any places the function is called from checked code. As an example, we can convert a C library function to check C using a bound safe interface. Note that we have two unchecked pointer parameters and an unchecked return type to convert. Since this function deals with strings, we can mark its string parameters and return types with the alternate type of a null terminated array pointer. Since the function reads n characters from the source string and writes n characters to the destination, we want to require that both strings point to at least n characters. We can also specify that the function returns a string that points to at least n characters. Once we've added the bound safe interface to the function, we can update its callees. If it is called with unchecked pointers, there are no changes necessary. Even though the source parameter here points to only two characters, including the null terminator, there is no error here since unchecked arguments are not bounds checked. When the function is called with checked pointers, however, they must meet the bounds specified in the bound safe interface. For example, this code would result in a compile time error since the source parameter only points to two characters, including the null terminator, and it is expected to point to at least three. Not all functions with string parameters also accept a size parameter. For functions like this, how can we determine the string's bounds? The choice is often the length of the string. However, this is currently not allowed in check C. Bounds expressions can only use C expressions that do not modify memory. Since function calls may modify memory, they are considered modifying expressions and are not allowed in bounds. Therefore, we need an extra parameter here to specify bounds for the string. The check C convert tool helps convert C programs to check C. It can automatically convert unchecked pointers to checked singleton, array, and null terminated array pointers. This summer, the check C team had two interns work on testing check C on a large systems code base. The interns spent five weeks converting portions of the string and network subdirectories of the muscle library to check C. In the muscle string library, 31 functions and 316 lines of code were converted to check C. In the muscle network library, 51 functions and 729 lines of code were converted to check C. We would check C on selected benchmarks from the LLVM LNT tests. We focus here on the difference in code size, runtime, and compile time for converted versus unconverted code. On average, 17.5% of the lines of code in these benchmarks were modified as part of the process of converting them to check C. And on average, 9.3% of the code in these converted benchmarks remained unchecked after converting them to check C. 
code size of the converted benchmarks was an average of 7.4% larger than the unconverted benchmarks. The runtime of the converted benchmarks was an average of 8.6 longer than that of the unconverted benchmarks. The compile time for the converted benchmarks was an average of 24.3% longer than that of the unconverted benchmarks. Thank you all for attending our talk. If you were interested, please view additional resources on Check to See. Thank you. Thank you, Mandeep and Catherine, for that presentation. That was great. And thank you all for participating. And uh, we're going to move to our question and answer. Uh, first question, um, Mandeep, this one's for you. Did you consider using uh, SAT solvers, uh, for example, Microsoft's uh, Z3, to verify the semantic equivalence of two expressions? Yes. Uh, actually, last summer, uh, we had an intern who, who actually worked on using SAT solvers for checking equivalence of expressions. Uh, and I have posted two links uh, which describe the C Horn and the Z3 um, SAT solvers and his experiments with using those solvers for uh, uh, for semantic comparison of expressions. So that's men mentioned in the chat window. Uh, thank you. Yeah, those are uh, in our, our public GitHub repo. So um, if if they're not currently available on Huba, we'll we'll make sure we can comment on those. Um, next question. Uh, can we talk about uh, check C? Um, can check C prevent uh, temporal and memory safety bugs, for example, use after free? Um, so check C is really about spatial ensuring spatial safety, uh, and we haven't yet, uh, you know, experimented with using check C for temporal uh, memory safety. So I'm not sure uh, if I would be able to answer that question. Uh, the current answer is no. Uh, but I'm not really sure about that. Okay, that's fair. Uh, here's another question. According to your company, uh, about 70% of Windows bugs are memory related and would be fully eliminated in languages with managed memory such as Go and Rust. Do you have data on what percent of these 70% would be eliminated by using Check C? Uh, actually, this is a very large sample space to get the, the, the full data for. I mean, I mean, we are talking about the entire company. So yeah, we haven't yet uh, analyzed Check C uh, for all of these different code bases. So I won't be able to answer that question as well. Well, one thing I, I do want to add about that, um, there's a lot of existing value uh, out there in the open source community and um, you know, as part of a proprietary IP that, that exists that's already implemented in C. And so with a compiler like Check C providing an on-ramp uh, to take that existing legacy code and make it more safe and more secure uh, can add a lot of value and, and work with a lot of that existing value that's currently there. Um, you know, Go and Rust are beautiful languages. I personally love using both, um, but it if you already have existing uh, intellectual property of some sort, um, there are advantages to, to on-ramping that. Uh, here, here's another question. Um, Actually, speaking of, speaking of Rust, generally speaking, is is uh, the memory safety support in Check C a subset of that of Rust? Can you talk uh, about a little bit of comparison and contrast on this, Jim? Uh, I'm not really aware of Rust uh, and 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 the details of Rust, but I can certainly talk about Check C's uh, memory safety features. So yeah, so basically, comparing it with Rust will be difficult for me. Okay, that's that's fair. Um, how about uh, we we talk a little bit about some of the conversions that you have done, which which you did have detailed uh, somewhat in the slides. Can you talk about what is the largest program that you've mostly converted to Check C, and what percentage of lines did you have to change? Uh, so I, I can answer this. So as we mentioned in that presentation, I believe this is on line uh, fifty. Or, sorry, on, on line slide fifty nine. I would say probably the largest program that we have mostly converted to check C would be the portions of the LNT benchmark suites. And on average, I believe about 17 and percent of the lines of code had to be modified. About 80% of those modifications we would consider to be trivial. So a lot of those um, updates to the program were considered very easy to make. And if you're interested, there's more details on that conversion in the check C sective paper, which is linked to on the final slide of the presentation. Great, thank you. 
Um, so what about upstreaming plans? Can we talk uh, some about what upstreaming really means for Check C as a compiler and uh, your thoughts on, on you know, how it is uh, as a compiler or a language extension or as a language itself? Yeah, so we do have plans to, uh, in, in, in near future, upstream uh, Check C to the community. Uh, in fact, we have been uh, trying to keep the comp uh, our folk of Check C um, as current as possible. We, we, we try to regularly merge it with the upstream code. Uh, and in near future, you should uh, uh, basically hear from our team uh, on our uh, you know, plans to upstream the stuff. Thank you. Um, here's a, another interesting question. So the presentation explained how check C can call uh, into un, uh, unchecked code, but not how unchecked code would call into check C. Can I have a C program call into a check C library? Does it need a regular C header? So check C introduces the notion of bound safe interfaces to help support backwards compatibility. So if a check C library has a bound safe interface header or a header that's been converted using a bound safe interface, then an unchecked C code can call into that using the bound safe interface using unchecked pointers. Thank you. Um, here, here's a, a different question. How does check C compare to soft bound and sets, uh, CETS? Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm I'm not aware of what is soft or soft bounds and CEDS. Yeah, I'm not aware of those either. Uh, Catherine, are you aware? I, sorry, I'm not familiar with those either. Maybe if you sorry. can elaborate or, or or give us some pointers, and then we can take this question offline. Um, one thing I do want to point out, uh, the white papers that we have in the Check C repo do have some comparisons to uh, other um, attempts of making C a, a safer, more secure language. So feel free to check those out, um, those, those publications, um, some of which were conducted uh, in collaboration with the University of Maryland. Um, new question, you, you mentioned code size increase. Do you have details on why Check C would cause code size increases? Specifically, does Check C uh, inhibit optimizations? So I can take part of this question. Uh, so one of the reasons why Check C may cause code size increase is because Check C adds runtime checks for non-nullness and bounds checks. Uh, so that is one of the main reasons why Check C may increase code size. Uh, and um, Catherine can maybe talk about uh, by how much percent have we seen uh, the code size being increased in, in the codes we've converted. I think there was a slide mentioning uh, about that. Yeah, so there, there was a slide talking about the specific uh, percentage increase that we saw in code size. Um, of course, I do not remember the number on the slide off the top of my head, but I would encourage you to refer to the slides in the presentation that mention these numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, here's an interesting question. What kind of uh, backend or target specific support uh, would make implementing the checks and check C easier, if any? Uh, I think uh, one of the uh, main things which we are trying to avoid is generating runtime checks. Uh, because uh, as I said before, uh, they tend to increase the code size. Uh, so basically, if we can somehow, if, if the compiler can somehow detect uh, uh, that, the, that the runtime uh, checks can be elided, then that would be a great thing. So I think going forward, uh, we want to be, you know, uh, try to uh, work on the back end to try to uh, optimize away these runtime checks if possible by using some optimizations. Okay, uh, we talked about this a little bit. If we could go into more detail, um, is Check C not compatible with legacy code? And where are the bounds stored? Is there any metadata maintained? So Check C is compatible with legacy code. Uh, that is where the bound safe interface concept uh, comes into picture. So basically you can take uh, legacy headers and, and convert them to Check C using bound safe interfaces. And uh, um, you can do that. And, and then you can use Check C without breaking backwards compatibility. And uh, so what was the second part of the question, sorry? Um, is there any metadata or, or storage associated with that? So there's no metadata uh, associated with uh, the checks. The entire information is stored inside the program uh, as, as invariants inside uh, variables. Okay, uh, great. 
So um, one question that I, I want to add, um, how do you test check to see code? Um, are there anything that, that you need to do that um, you would normally test with C code that you don't have to do with check C and vice versa, things that you have to do for extra testing? And then uh, how do you design tests to, to try to better catch you know, some of the runtime checks that check C provides? Um, so currently we have converted a couple of code bases uh, like the parser on JSON parser and the string and the network uh, functions of the muscle C library to check C. Uh, in addition to this, the University of Maryland team who is working on the automated conversion tool for check C uh, has converted the VS FTPD uh, code base to check C. So we have these uh, three or four code bases which we use for, for regular testing. Uh, on the question of uh, is there something that needs to be extra tested? I guess um, everything needs to be extra tested. And, uh, and the question about how do we design tests to try uh, to better catch runtime checks? Um, so we have written a lot of uh, unit tests for runtime checks. And we've also added a function called dynamic check, which can take a predicate as input. And basically it will insert a runtime check for that predicate. And uh, if the runtime check fails, then it'll uh, raise a, 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 a sig ill. So basically it'll execute a, an unknown instruction, an illegal instruction. Okay. Um, and why did you choose LLVM? And are there aspects of it that make it easier or harder to accomplish what, what you're trying to do on this project? Um, I guess there were a couple of reasons why we chose LLVM. Um, the first one was, uh, I think, the permissive MIT license of LLVM as compared to GCC's um, GNU license. And the second is because LLVM is more modular and hence it makes it uh, easy to extend the compiler and also the tooling support on, on LLVM is, uh, is far superior to that on GCC. And um, are there aspects of it that uh, makes it easier or harder to use? Um, I think one of the roadblocks we are encountering is uh, the Clang's memory model because Clang tends to allocate all the objects in the context and we haven't found a way of clearing this context on demand. Um, so as a result, in several cases in check C, uh, we tend to allocate objects on the context and, and we do not clean up afterwards. So there are several mem memory leaks which we are encountering. Okay. Uh, so we talked a little bit about that, that runtime overhead. Do we know what the makeup of the, that overhead is? And do you know which checks are most expensive at runtime? Um, Catherine, do we have data on that? Uh, as far as I know, we don't have data on specifically which runtime checks are most expensive. We do have data on just the overall percentage of runtime overhead increase. Um, again, I encourage you to refer to the, the slide that, re that refers to this. But as far as I know, we don't have more specific data on the different types of runtime checks. So basically, we uh, we insert two main types of runtime checks. One is the nullness check, and one is the bounce check. So for bounce check, we actually insert two checks. One is checking if if the value is or or, or if the access is greater than the low, greater than or equal to the lower bound, and the second check is if the access is uh, less than the upper bound. So there are two checks there. So I think uh, the bounce checks are uh, are more costlier. Okay. And um, do you have any uh, special testing for check C to ensure that bounce checks are never optimized out when they should not be? Uh, I guess we don't have that yet. I, I mean, we haven't yet looked into that. Uh, and that is something uh, which we should be looking into, yeah. Because right now, our goal has been uh, safety, uh, correctness, and, and security. So we have really not experimented with the higher optimization levels like O3. So we have been trying, we have so far tested uh, on either OS or I guess O1. Yeah. Yeah. These these are really good questions. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I do believe we're running out of time. And so um, I just wanted to thank you all for joining this session and for submitting your questions. Uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation in the community board uh, of Whova uh, or in the roundtable sessions. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.